Hello friends, you are listening to the part 2 of The Witch Haven authored by Sasha Peter Smith and narrated to you by audiobooks with Keeper of Lost Stories. Let's start with chapter 4 today. My mind takes a moment to catch up to what Maxine just said to me. The words Haxhaven Academy bounce around between my ears before I fully grasp their meaning. Academy? I turned to her. Haxhaven Academy, yes, that's what I said. She's smiling like she finds my frantic confusion comical. You said this was a sanitarium. A most clever disguise. You will find we are very clever here, she says with a wink. If we were friends, I'd tell her to quit it with the dramatics. But we are not friends. Girls bustling around the great hall, slow few at a time, stopping to take in the newcomer standing in their foyer. They glance at me briefly, a few mutter something to their nearby friends, and then they continue on their way. I imagine how I must look to them, standing in their fairy tale entryway. I wish I had time for a bath, or that I was not still wearing a corset stained with the blood of a man I had killed. Helen steps in through the front door, back from parking the ambulance. She stands square and squat next to Lee Maxine. The long trip has made her hair even frizzier, and it springs from the fluffy bun atop her head as if trying to escape. Be nice to the poor girl, Maxine, she scolds. I am being nice, Maxine responds, offended by the way and the very idea of her introduction lacking niceness. Be nice or I will be the one conducting the orientation, she says with a small jab to Maxine's rib cage with her elbow. Maxine huffs out an annoyed sigh. What's the fun in being a witch if I can't be a mysterious witch? Helen rolls her eyes and walks toward a door to the left of the entry hall. Over her shoulder she calls, Be nice or I'll tell Mrs. Wykotsky you're not to be trusted with the next one. Helen's always so certain she knows what's best, Maxine whispers to me conspiratorially. My mind whirs in an attempt to consolidate the hurricane of information dumped on me. You said this was an academy? I look at her for confirmation, and she nods once, obviously annoyed that I have been so slow on the uptake. Aren't you a nurse? Where are the patients? Where do we coalesce? She shrugs. We lied. You lied? The room tilts a little. My knees are weak, because no one lets us take girls away for something as inconsequential as an education. It's the closest thing I've gotten to what feels like an honest answer from her. I left school at 14 to work. I had no intention of returning. The Clinton Street Public School on the Lower East Side could only be described as brutal. I think I must have loved learning at some point in my life. But rulers on knuckles wrapped all the questions out of me a long time ago. And yet here we come. I don't understand. She sighs heavily. You'll meet with a headmistress shortly. The whole murder charge thing mucked up the orientation process. We had to get you out quickly. Sorry about that. I did not have much of a choice. I snap. She is disarmingly sincere as she replies. We know. How? I can't quite say. The headmistress is particular about the welcome speech she gives to the new girls. What I am allowed to tell you is that you are safe, you are sane, and you are not in any trouble. Then she turns on her heel and trots up the marble stairs. I follow her because my other option is to stay standing like an idiot in the entryway alone. Maxine's long legs carry her so quickly. I have to hurry to stay behind her, muttering frustrated little excuse me's to the other girls as I push past them, 
the odd thing I realize for a moment is that they are not all girls. The people in the foyer and on the staircase are women of all ages, all in the same black cape and pinafore. One woman has cropped snow white hair. Another girl of only 10 or 11 passes me in a rush. A few even wear trousers, light streams in front of the windows, casting the marble hall in a glow so white. It's almost blinding. Maxine takes me across the second floor landing and up another side staircase to the third floor. Here the carpet is lush and black in contrast to the stark white of the floors below. Only small slivers of good gold damask walls are visible. The rest is almost entirely covered with portraits, tintypes and photographs of women. I pass one photograph that can't be more than a few years old of a group of girls smiling and laughing with their arms thrown around one another in front of a lake. It hangs next to a portrait of a very stern looking woman wearing an Elizabethan collar. It's unclear where the girls on the stairs and in the entryway are headed, but it was not here. The halls upstairs seem to be abandoned except for Maxine and me. A flash of movement from the corner of my eye makes me jump. With a gasp, I bring my hand to my chest. As a tabby cat emerges from the dark corner, a still flapping moth in her mouth and a self-satisfied look in her eye. They are everywhere, Maxine says in response to my startle. Cats? Yes, the cats. Intentionally? Not particularly. They keep the moths at bay and most don't scratch too badly. The black one in the kitchen bites, though. The tabby retreats with her prize back into the shadows and I follow Maxine down the hall. We pass door after wooden door until finally she stops at one painted with an elegant eleven. This will be our room, Maxine says. Despite Maxine's assurances of safety, I'm so confused and upset. I've been taken from my home, my job, and told I'm to live at this strange school full of strange women. The thought of my mother sitting alone and without visitors in the asylum makes me sick. It's not Maxine's fault, it's not anyone's fault, but Mr. Hughes, but knowing that doesn't stop the waves of anger, Maxine pushes the door open. Upon first glance, I'm reminded of the apartment above the dress shop, four beds, two on each side, pushed against the walls. But unlike the cheap iron bedsteads of the shop apartment, these are hand-carved wooden canopy beds, like the hallway. The carpet in this room is a lush black that contrasts beautifully with the gold vanity positioned at the far side of the room. The wallpaper is the same as the hallway. It must be the nicest room I've ever been in. Here is your bed, Maxine waves toward the bed closest to us on the left side of the room. I trust you'll find all you need here. The full uniform is let up for you already and you'll find four more hanging in the wardrobe. Shoes are under the bed. The rest of the girls will show you where everything else is kept. All right. I suspect you're exhausted. After my first outburst, I slept for three days. Thought my head was going to explode with the pain of it. Some girls are out for a week. I'll let you rest. She makes her way for the door. Outburst? A blurt. She turns to face me, her eyebrows raised in question. I'm suddenly very angry with Maxine and all of her sly smiles. It wasn't my fault. I don't know how the scissors ended up in his neck, but I did not put them there. Maxine sighs. Mr. Wykotsky will explain everything. I'm not going to jail, then? Speaking the words feel dangerous, as if somehow by acknowledging that I'm a person who belongs in prison. I make it real. Maxine laughs and turns to exit the room. Not yet. She calls on her way out the door. And then I'm alone. I walk to the bed, my bed, and thumb over the uniform someone's let out for me. A black cotton blouse that puffs out a little before coming in at the elbows, with a black pinafore led on the top. There's a pair of 
black woolen knee socks, a coil of black velvet ribbon for my hair, and my very own cape, the same as everyone else's. I trail my fingers over the clothing. The quality of the fabric and the construction is extraordinary. What I am most thrilled about, however, are the undergarments. Three perfect corsets accompanied by silk chemises nicer than anything I have ever owned. The thought of ripping my blood-stained corset off fills me with such relief. I choke out an elated laugh into the empty room. In the mirror on the far side of the room, I catch a glimpse of my throat. A mottled grows green. It does not matter. This skin does not feel much like my own anyhow. Maxine was right about the exhaustion. I feel about as heavy and lucid as a dog, but I don't slip immediately beneath the duvet. I walk to the single pane diamond glass window and place my hand at the spot where the cold leaches through the casing. The third floor offers an unobstructed view of the tangle of trees that is Forest Park. Directly below me, encased with Hexhaven's wall, is a sad courtyard. I unclip the lock and push the window open simply for the reassurance that I can. Three floors up is too far to pump. Not that I would. Not yet at least. Finally, I lie down on top of the blankets because I don't know what else to do. The canopy is made of dark red velvet that matches the covers led across the bed. I run around my hands over the real goose down pillows and sigh. Once when I was six, I was sent home from school because I could not stop crying. When my mother inquired as to what happened, I did my best to explain. I told her I had raised my hand, which I rarely did, and asked my teacher when were we going to learn what was on the other side of the map of the world that hung on the wall of her classroom. She flipped it over and showed me it was blank. That is the whole world. There is no more. All the things I would ever see or know were painted right there on a the paper with no second side. No new world to explore. There was no more. My little heart could not take it. But now, in a bed carved with fairies and snaking vines, I feel as if my teacher may have been wrong. Here I am, on the opposite side of the map, in a world that is entirely new. I dream of a mansion draped in golds and maroons. A group of men in finely tailored suits sits around a glossy mahogany table. I'm standing in the corner, watching their meeting like a specter, when a boy in a grey overcoat and disheveled curly hair sidles up to me. He reaches over to hold my hand, except, no, he's handing me something. He presses my sewing shears into my hand. They are as warm as an embrace and wet with thick blood. It seeps hot between my fingers. A single drop falls onto the white carpet. The boy winks. The men at the table go silent. Their gaze is snapped to me. I wake, disoriented, but the feathered pillow is solid beneath my head. The damask wallpaper, the velvet canopy, that's all still here too. This room, at least, isn't something I dreamed up. The boy, he is real too, or was real at one point. We have met before. He was in my apartment last December, just after Christmas. I remember it vividly, William barreling into the apartment well after dark, waking me from a dead sleep on a night so cold there was frost on my guilt. I lit the lamp on my bedside table and carried it out into the kitchen, where I found William half-stumped and hanging off the shoulders of a disarmingly handsome boy. He never brought friends around, unless the friend was Oliver, and even that was rare. My brother and this boy were swaying in the entryway singing a drinking song about a lost love. They were silent when they saw me. What's wrong? I greeted them. Mm, fine, William slurred. A bit too much to drink, I'm afraid, the boy replied. Well, I hope you had fun, I sniped. My annoyance teetered dangerously on the edge of rage. William never came home drunk. I did not even know he drank. I'd spent all evening cleaning the apartment, scraping together a stove full of food, brushing mom's hair, organizing the wash, all while William was out making a fool of himself with friends I did not know.
Thanks, I'll take him from here, I said to the boy. He looked at me a little glass-eyed, and I wondered if he had had too much to drink too. I'm Finn, he blurted. I remember being surprised by his Irish accent. Ah, oh, Finny boy, William muttered into his friend's collar. I wasn't expecting an introduction. Um, I'm Francis, William's sister. He talks about you, Finn replied. My precious baby sister, William mumbled as I transferred one of his arms from Finn's shoulder to mine. William stumbled, almost taking me to the floor with him. Whoa, 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 Finn breathed, picking up my brother's other side. Together we half walked, half dragged William to his bed and led him down on top of the covers. Finn made quick work of my brother's shoelaces, which was impressive because he was not looking at William. He was looking at me. The kind of penetrating, serious gaze that made me want to hide behind my unbound hair. How do you know, my brother? We work together. William had left his position as Judge Callahan's errand boy a year or so before, and I was seeing less and less of him as the months went on. All I knew was that he was working at a gentleman's association as an assistant. The club was filled with important men. Do well enough there and they might mentor him in business, he told me whenever I complained. You work at the club too? Aye. What do you do there? Doesn't much matter. He opened his mouth as if there was something more he wanted to say. I gave him silence, but he did not take the opportunity. William's face was properly buried in his pillow now. I feel awful. Why do you make me drink so much? He mumbled. Oh, it hardly seems fair to blame me. Finn trialed. All the whiskey you gave me, I won't be able to work tomorrow. I'll cover your shift. Don't you worry. But you know the real loss is yours. Tomorrow is Sunday, so boss will be wearing his purple suit. William completed Finn's sentence with as much of a laugh as he was able, given his state. I'll paint you a stirring verbal portrait upon your return, my friend. Finn patted William's back and stood up from where he was perched at the end of the bed. No, don't go, William shouted. We have to write more songs, or we'll never get the musical off the gob. The musical, I prompted. Seemed like a good idea to write a musical together three whiskeys ago. My name will be in lights, Francis, William exclaimed. I sighed heavily. Time to sleep, William. You never let me have any fun. Seems that you have plenty of fun for the both of us. I snapped. Not fair. I work so hard. My brother trailed off, closing his eyes. You work hard? I mocked him. I'd show you that my hands are bleeding from all the work at the shop today. But I'm wearing these gloves because this apartment is so cold. I lose all feeling in my hands if I don't. But it's fine. I understand. We have both had a long night. You with your friends... Me reading our mother Charles' goddamn Dickens until she relaxed enough to fall asleep without you here. Sadness well thick in my throat. I wanted to punish my brother, but instead I'd only made myself look like a fool in front of his friend. The tears were stupid, as tears almost always are. Mm. Sorry, Francis. William rolled onto his back and raised his arms from the bed like he meant to hug me but they collapsed heavily back to the mattress. Sorry, it doesn't do me much good now. Just sleep. We'll talk in the morning. Our mother used to say there was something about the middle of the night that always made things seem worse than they were. Good night, my friend, Finn said with a pat on William's head. I walked Finn to the door because it seemed like the polite thing to do. Nice to meet you, Francis. Finally, he said in the doorway. Finally, your brother thinks the world of you. I did not return his smile. Don't let him drink that much whiskey again. Finn reached for the dead bolt at the same time I did, and our hands brushed just barely. They are nice gloves, for what it's worth, he said, head ducked low, not quite meeting my eye. Well, you never know when guests might come by, and to be caught without my gloves would be quite the society scandal, I joked but it did not hide the edge in my voice.
Well, I'll be happy to report the society pages. Your good manners remain intact, he said, which was kind because he felt how cold the apartment was. Heard my humiliating outburst at William. He could have chosen to embarrass me, but he did not. I don't remember if I said good night, but he did. Halfway out the door with a final glance back at me like he was searching for something in my face. I scrub a hand across my eyes and try to clear William from my brain. Some memories sting more than others. I don't know how long I napped for. It's still light outside, but the hallway is silent and the courtyard is empty. Wherever the classrooms are, they are far from this wing. I amble through the room for a few minutes, poking through the drawers and closets of my roommates. I don't find anything interesting. I'm not sure what I was expecting. Maybe a diary with entries like help, their capes are beautiful, but they won't let me outside. Instead, I discover uniforms identical to the one let out on my bed. A few books, scattered papers and inkwells, a bottle of lilac perfume and pair of pearl earrings thrown carelessly on a chair. All the rifling through drawers is beginning to make me feel like a criminal. I need to take a walk. To taste the pines this mansion seems to be living inside. All my life I've lived in the city, among sirens, the buzzing of factories and smoke bellowing into the air. The silence of Hackshaven is so unsettling. I can't stand it. Maybe this would all feel less surreal if I could touch something alive. I rush down the steps, the eyes from the oil paintings and photographs following me as I go to the door. My fingers are outstretched, reaching for the brass handle when Maxine's voice cuts through the hoard like a knife. I had not even seen her in the foyer. What are you doing? She is sitting on a silk settee against the wall, a book in her hand and a horrified look on her face. Taking a walk in the park? No, no, you're not, she snaps. I don't know what it is I have done, but Maxine's tone makes it clear. It is no small mistake. I just... My eyes well up with tears like they always do when I'm embarrassed. God, I wish the past 24 hours contained less crying. I won't let more tears fall. You are never, ever to leave this building by yourself. Do you understand? Yes, I say. Though I don't understand at all. Good. Come with me then. She gives me a strained smile. Your timing is impeccable. It's time to meet the great Vygotsky. Chapter 5 Set against the starkness of the great foyer is a large black door that yawns like the mouth of something with teeth. It's early evening now and the marble floors glow pink with the sunset outside. Maxine picks up the handle of the golden eagle-shaped door knocker and lets it fall from her long fingers. The hollow thud of the door reverberates through my bones. Come in, an icy call comes from outside. Good luck, Maxine replies cheerfully, a little too cheerfully from what I have come to expect from Maxine. I take a breath, turn the brass handle and step inside. The room is low-lit, swathed in black velvets and dark wood. The black wall is made up entirely of shelves containing tiny dust-covered jars and vials. The vaulted ceiling is adorned with dried bouquet of baby's breath and sprigs of herbs hanging upside down on long strings of twine, hovering just above my head. A white woman, perhaps sixty, sits at an ebony desk covered in delicate whirring brass instruments stacks of yellowing papers and a small pile of dried up inkwells. Like her office, she is dressed entirely in black velvet. From her floor length dress to her cape, identical to those the other women wear, save for the fabric and the monstrous moonstone brooch secured at her throat. Her snow white hair is piled atop her head in a pompadour. She sits as straight as a board in her chair her eyes narrowed, looking down her pointy nose at me. All the while, she drums her fingers along the desk, so pale they are nearly translucent, purple veins popping up at each knuckle. She looks like the kind of woman Mrs. Carey might get along splendidly with. You must be Miss Hallowell, she speaks, after a moment of examination. Her voice has the dignity and pointed pronunciation of the upper class. 
the kind of voice that, through force of sheer habit, nearly has me reaching to my pocket for an order form, asking what kind of dress she is looking for. I take a single careful step inside. My boots sink into the plush carpet. Yes, ma'am. Please, won't you take a seat? She offers, gesturing to the straight-backed velvet armchair across from her. The overstuffed cushion is so tall, my feet raise the carpet. I can't help but swing them back and forth like a child. The woman spends a moment looking me up and down with the gaze that makes me feel like my insides are being spooled out for her inspection. When she is satisfied, she speaks. It is important to me that you know, first and foremost, the Hacks Heaven is a place of healing. So is this a sanitarium or a school? She purses her line, thin lips, both in a way, I suppose. There are 10,000 questions I want to ask this woman. Why was I brought here? How did you find me? But the questions stick in my throat like a hunk of stale bread, so I stay silent under her intense stare. She must sense my discomfort. You are safe here and very welcome. But something about the way her mouth curls around her teeth makes a chill spiral walk down my spine. Thank you, ma'am. I suppose you have many questions for me. But please allow me to first give you the speech I give all our new girls. I realize that what I am about to tell you may sound rather suspect, but I need you to trust me. Can you trust me, Francis? I nod, even though I trust this woman about as far as I can throw her. She smiles like she's pleased. Some may call what we can do magic, but it is simply a function of your divine self, of your soul, the same soul that inhibits every other human on this planet. We just have the ability to use more of it, to manifest it in ways uncommon in the general population. I'm not sure what I was expected to do, but I wasn't this. Maybe she's a liar or this is an elaborate joke. Magic? Yes, Francis, magic. Like the way those scissors sold across the room and into the man's neck. Nerves ricochet through me. How do you know about that? Inference. Mrs. Wykotsky smiles in the particularly annoying way the old smile at the young with pitying condescension. She is at once a frustrating and terrifying woman. I am too old to believe in magic. It would be easier for you to tell me the truth. Again, she smiles. You think you are smart? I don't think I'm anything, ma'am. Allow me to prove you wrong. She raises her hand from her desk, and her pen levitates right along with it. My stomach lurches. I close my eyes as if I can blink away witnessing the impossible. It hurts to look at, like my mind refuses to take in what I'm seeing. How do you do that? Magic. The simplicity and impossibility of the pen floating in the air sends a fissure through my brain, cracking everything I thought I knew of the world in half. Do it again. And she does. One by one she levitates each object on her overcrowded desk. She sends a hard candy wrapped in purple foil drifting across the room where it settles in my lap. Eat it, she offers. I feel like I did the first time I rode the subway, the lurching nausea and sense of amazement. There is an undercurrent of fear too, sensation of hurting through darkness. No, thank you. I have a lot of questions. With each of the objects now firmly back on her desk, she keeps her hands folded carefully in front of her. I'd imagine so. But I feel the thing inside me, the thing that sent the scissors flying at Mr. Hughes, and it whispers that she's telling the truth. It's there in my gut, something golden and inexplicable, something awake. I try to let it all settle in, this truth, what she's trying to tell me by not telling me, magic. I have magic, which means my eyes dart to hers. She can see me putting everything together, piece by piece. Mrs. Wykotsky leans forward, waiting for me to say it. I am a witch. The word is so ridiculous, I almost don't get it out. If that's the word you wish to use, the truth is you possess an extraordinary ability. It is who you are. 
my vision tunnels. I grip the armrest of the uncomfortable chair. I need something solid for purchase. I can do what you do, I say. Move things with my mind? I can do impossible things? Magic is derived from the human soul. It is as varied as humanity itself. But yes, with proper training, you will have the ability to move things with your mind. How? How is it that the world is entirely different from what I have been told? Few people are gifted with the ability to perform what is commonly called magic. This ability is typically awoken by a traumatic event. You can think of your ability as your very soul being expanded. The explanation as to why is between you and your God. The knots in my chest uncoil, just enough to breathe again. How long does it take to learn? Depends on the person. Girls are usually with us for a number of years. Think of this time as our magical secondary education. It is our sincerest hope that you find your time with us valuable and instructive. Years. I file the information away to panic about later. But I can't get lost in nerves just yet. I have too many questions. Can you bring the dead back to life? I try to feel the weight of what I'm being told. But the only thing I can think of is William. Mrs. Wykotsky swallows. If only. Disappointment burns through me. I settle back into the chair. What good is having magic if it can't bring him back? Our job is to keep you safe. If thousands of years of history have taught us one thing, it is that the world is not kind to women who possess power. I will give you exactly one warning, Francis. You will do what we say, and we will keep you safe. You do not want to be a witch in the world alone, nor do you want your power to eat you up from the inside out. Do you understand? This time I'm honest with her. No, ma'am. I'm afraid I don't. She leans forward with the grace of a snake. Are you familiar with the great New York City fire of 1845? I shake my head. The story I'm about to tell you does not begin with the fire, but rather it ends with it. In the 1840s, a group of idealistic witches left our beloved Haxhaven for the thrill of the city. They took their magic and their youth and they set up a coven in a copper-roofed building on Broad Street. There they lived together and they practiced their magic recklessly on street corners and at parties for anyone who could pay the price. It was small magic, the manipulation of objects, identifying the first initial of someone's secret lover. Mrs. Vygotsky pauses for a moment to watch my reaction. If I had been born 70 years earlier, I would have wanted to have been friends with these women, but I don't get the impression that's the reaction the headmistress wants from me. So I nod solemnly. She purses her lips and continues, voice grave. But word got around about the witches and their warehouse, and those who would prefer to keep magic to themselves burned the warehouse to the ground. All 13 of the witches died, as well as the 13 more civilians and four firemen. My blood runs cold, imagining the horror of it all. The fire commissioner never could explain why the warehouse was enriched with salt and gunpowder. But those of us here knew what it meant. Witches are not stupid, Miss Hallowell. We are not reckless and we heed the warnings we are given. But who burned down the warehouse? Why not fight instead of hide? We hide because that is how we protect young witches like you and your classmates. We do not fight because there are many with gunpowder and matches and very few of us. Her answer makes me angry. How completely predictable. How infuriatingly boring that women with magic can be so easily intimidated by ordinary men with guns and matches. How few of us. There are 100 pupils here, and we gather every magical girl from the tri-state area. I trust you can do the math yourself. Yes, but I'm not here to debate you. I'm not here to be your friend. I'm here to keep you safe. It is an obligation I take seriously. Your days will be filled with coursework. You will take three classes as a student of Haxhaven Academy. Magical history, practical applications, and emotional control. I trust you'll find them illuminating. We do ask that you don't practice your abilities by yourself without the guidance and safety provided by a skilled instructor. 
I nod. The gesture feels too small an acknowledgement for the storm raging in my head. I want to shout or smash something. This is a school, a safe haven, and yes, in many ways a magical sanitarium. Our disguise as a tuberculosis hospital is intentional. We will train you and you will return to your life. In time, controlling your magic will be as easy as breathing. I think of my life spent sewing until my fingers bled. Returning doesn't sound like a happy ending. But I also think of Mr. Hughes and the noise he made as he drowned in his own blood. I don't mourn the man, but I would very much like to avoid killing someone again. Learning how to control this thing doesn't sound so terrible. You lived alone, correct? She asks me. Not alone exactly, above the shop. I worked in with the other girls. I moved in four months ago. So no family. I have no interest in talking about the unpleasant. So I say, no ma'am. That's good then. For most girls, the school sends a stipend home to make up for lost income. We tell the families it's a grant from the state. But it doesn't appear it will be necessary in this situation. No one will miss me. That's no matter. We are your family now. Her words ring in my ears. It is exactly what Mrs. Carey said to me my first day at the shop, on a day much different than this one. But Mr. Wyakotsky is staring at me across her ebony desk with a smile. I did nothing to earn plastered on her face, and it does not feel like the protection of my previous mentor. A white petal from one of the drying bunches flutters down the ceiling and lands on my shoulder. I brush it away and take a deep breath. Thank you, ma'am. I expect you to treat this as you would any other school. You will have class six days a week. Sundays are your own to do as you please. Stay within the garden walls. Don't leave after dark. Breakfast served at seven, lunch at noon, and dinner at six. Follow the rules. Ask the other girls for help, and I have no doubt you'll do well here. She studies me for a moment, her dark eyes raking over my face. I suspect we will speak again soon, Miss Hallowell. I rise, but she is already dipping her fountain pen in ink and scribbling away at the documents spread across her desk. She does not say goodbye as I walk through the door. I am in such shock my body does not feel like it belongs to me. Buzzy and weightless, my feet carry me to my still empty room where I flop down on the bed and stare at the ceiling. I am a witch, 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 witch. If William were here, he'd make a joke about putting a hex on our loud upstairs neighbors. He'd find this exciting and hilarious. William lived in life like something great was always right around the corner. The existence of magic would probably come as no surprise to him at all. But William is dead, and I'm alone and terrified, and more than a little confused. My heart beats loudly inside my chest. Which, which, which? It echoes, and I don't know if I want to be beat it louder or for the noise to go completely silent. There's a small plate of mashed potatoes and boiled chicken on my bedside, probably left by Maxine. It was a kind gesture, but I have no appetite. Eating is the last thing on my mind. What do I do now? Later that night, well past 3 a.m., I wake up with a start, the question still on my mind, plaguing me. The room is dark and quiet. The only noise is the heavy breathing of strangers who sleep in the other three beds. My new roommates must have come in at some point during the night. It's so cold. There's a spider web of frost on the window, illuminated by the silver light of the moon. And sitting on the pillow next to me is a small square of parchment Fold it gently in half. I reach for the note like I would a coiled snake. The rough paper feels dangerous under the pads of my fingers. I unfold it. Written in bold scrawl, 11 30 18 91 to 5 15 19 11. Justice undelivered. My body goes numb. The note falls noiselessly to the carpeted floor. November 30 1891 was my brother's birthday. May 15, 1911 was the last day he was seen alive. The words, just as undelivered, work their way under my skin. Hello, who's there? I hiss into the darkness. I don't receive an answer. 
The heavy sound of inhaling and exhaling makes it feel as though the room is breathing around me. I force myself up and out of bed, though the last thing I want to do is leave the warmth of my duvet. Shivering like a rabbit in a trap, I check the window first. It's locked from inside. The courtyard below is empty and beyond that, the park is an impenetrable black mass. Terrifyingly dark and still, a quiet rustle of fabric snaps my attention. Behind me, nothing, no one. My legs quiver as I approach the washroom, empty. I hear the noise again, it's quiet but distinct. And it's then I realize with horror that the sound is coming from the direction of my own bed. My heart is in my throat. Should I wake up my roommates? What would I even say to them? I swear under my breath, steal myself to check under my bed. I bite back a scream before calming my frayed nerves. God damn it. I hiss under my breath. A small black cat innocently paws at my bed skirt. It has the nerve to meow at me like it didn't just frighten me out of my own skin. I grab the tiny menace and haul it into bed with me. It nestles by my feet like we are best friends and not mortal enemies. It isn't until I'm back under the covers that I consider what I would have done if I'd found an intruder. Fight them? Scream? Go for another well-timed pair of flying scissors? My heart rate slows, but I still can't escape the itchy feeling of being watched. Perhaps this note is the proof I have been desperately searching for that my brother's death wasn't a random act of violence. Or perhaps it is proof that Hack Seven's pupil haze their new schoolmates in awful, unfunny ways. I don't know how these girls would know anything about my brother, but I also know that I no longer understand anything about what magic makes possible. Shaking, I shove the note under my mattress and spend the rest of the night in a fitful sleep, dreaming of my hands covered in ink and someone else's blood. Chapter 6 My eyes open to a gaggle of girls hopping out of bed, throwing on corsets and capes, brushing out their hair, and shouting across the room at one another. It's so similar to the shop. It takes me a moment to remember where I am. They fall silent at the sight of me stirring out of bed. I steal myself and hop up, attempting to smooth my hair and dress. I was so shaken last night. I did not even think to change into a nightgown. My new roommates and I take one another in simultaneously. They look similar enough to the girls I knew from the shop, though their cheeks are a little hollow. I am Frances, I say, my own name like a question. A round girl with rosy skin and beautiful masses of auburn hair piled up on her head speaks first. Aurelia Barton, she replies. She has a gap between her front tooth, which she reveals when she smiles at me reassuringly. The girl at her side could have been carved from ice. She's standing at the vanity mirror, tying her corn silk blonde hair up out of her face with a black ribbon. Ruby lad, pleasure. Her tone sounds as if it is anything but. It is only then that I see my third roommate emerging from behind the silk dressing screen in the corner of the room. She's tall. I don't have to stand next to her to know she's got several inches on me. She has tan skin and shiny black hair plaited in one long braid that reaches most of the way down her back. She stands with her head slightly down, as if she's pointedly avoiding my gaze. Lena Jamison. Her voice is cool, if a little disinterested. Aurelia sits down on the edge of her bed to lace her shoes and Ruby finishes her bow with the knot at herself in the mirror. My window of opportunity is closing quickly. I swallow my nerves and ask, This may sound strange, but did any of you leave a note on my bed last night? The looks on their faces are so genuinely confused, I believe they are telling the truth when they all mutter confused no's. What did the note say? Aurelia asks. I don't know how to begin to respond, so I chicken out instead. Must have been a strange dream. I lie poorly. Ruby and Aurelia share a confused look, button their capes over their pinafores, shout farewell and fuck out of the door arm in arm 
leaving Lena and me alone in static silence. I stand near my bed, not sure what to do next. I want to ask Lena if she was once as scared as I am now, or what magic feels like to her. I wonder if her family misses her, if she is from the city or some place I've never been. You will need to put on the cape for breakfast. She offers from across the room. Thank you. It comes out as a sigh of relief. As a seamstress, I appreciate the construction of clothes. But I, what I wear has always been a matter of strict practicality. Buttoning the cape over my chest feels like something different entirely. I straighten my spine but avoid glancing in the mirror. I don't want to know if Mr. Hugh's fingers are still imprinted on my throat. Will you walk with me? I don't know where to go, I ask Lena. Her smile is reluctant. Why not? Follow me. The black cape flutters behind me as I go with Lena to the stairs, and it makes me feel like a very important glamorous lady, or maybe a small bat, I can't decide. The pristine sh stairs sink peculiarly under my feet, like they're rotting from the inside out. Lena and I walk through more shining halls, to a pair of immense double doors that leads into a shimmering dining room, bedecked in sparkling crystal and gold scones. In the center are three mahogany tables, shine within an inch of their life, capable of seating a hundred at least. Lena chooses a seat, and I plop down gracelessly next to her. More and more girls pour into the room. Lena and I don't speak. I can't relax. I scan each of their faces, wondering which person in this room left the note on my pillow. It has to have been one of them. I'm chewing violently on the inside of my cheek when someone sits down in the seat next to me. Good morning. How are your roommates? Maxine asks. And the sight of her sharp face and hazel eyes fills me with surprising relief. She crosses her legs in front of her, leaning off the side of the chair, looking casual, roguelike even. She wears the uniform differently than most girls, with the collar unbuttoned around her throat, her cape hanging just slightly off center, like a costume, like she's in on a joke. You got stuck with Lad and Barton, right? She continues. And Lena Jemson. I add, gesturing to her with a nod of my head. Lena peeks around me. Hi, Maxine. Sorry to you both, getting stuck with those shoes, Maxine says. Aurelia doesn't seem so bad, I trail off. She's not, when she is not around Ruby, but she has the spine of a jellyfish. She'll do whatever she's told, Lena explains. Count your blessings, girls. There are worse than Ruby and Aurelia. Maxine replies. Oh, I fidget in my chair. For such a large dining table, it is noticeably absent of any food. Mm-hmm, Maxine nods and takes a swig of water. Like those two over there, she gestures to a pair of near-identical round-faced blondes at the other end of the room. The Underwood sisters, Hattie and Beatrix, mean as a whole, a pit of vipers, but most of the girls are fine. Just mind your manners and smile pretty. I open my mouth to respond, but come up short as a feast on sparkling silver platters come through the dining table carried by women in black capes just like my own, entire glazed hams, bowls of fruits and vegetables spilling over, French toast, bacon, eggs and apples boiled with cinnamon. Maxine reaches out and serves herself a spoonful of diced peaches as if this is all old hat. Where did this come from? I ask. The kitchens, she says, through a mouthful of toast. There is more food on this table than I've ever seen in life. I can't tell her I don't remember the last time. I had enough to eat. My father left soon after I was born, so my whole life was my mother, William and me trying to survive. My mother did her best, which wasn't very good. She'd taken neighbors' laundry and cleaned the other apartments in our building, but she was never stable enough to hold down a steady job. There was one Christmas when all we had to do was eat a handful of chestnuts and a crust of old bread. My mother made William and me drape napkins on our heads and told us we were just like Joseph and Mary in the inner innkeeper's barn. I was six and William had just turned nine. And 
we no longer believed in fairy stories. The next day, Williams went out on his own and got his post as Judge Callan's errand boy. But Maxine doesn't need to know all about that. So I answer, of course, and take a bite that turns to sawdust in my mouth. I feel too full of questions to swallow anything. Maxine notices me, pushing the food around my plate. Aren't you hungry? Objectively, probably. My attempt at a smile is poor. Seems like a waste of pancakes. It's almost as if having one's reality torn to shreds ruins an appetite. Lena deadpans. I don't mean to spoil breakfast. It's just that I don't feel my brain has caught up to what's happening. A school for magic girls isn't what you expected when you woke up yesterday. Maxine laughs. When I woke up yesterday, I thought I'd been prisoned by nightfall. No bars on the windows here, Lena says, her voice tinged with sarcasm. Just a 12-foot wall that keeps us safe, sweet Lena, Maxine replies. Though I don't have an ap- appetite, what I do have is more questions, and I wonder if there will ever be a time when I don't. How is it that a school for magic exists and no one has found out about it? It seems more a reasonable question than how is it possible that everything I've ever thought to be true about the laws of universe is wrong? The school used to be disguised as a convent. If there was one group of women the world left alone, it was nuns. But then the local churches began asking questions, so it was converted to a school back in the 1850s. It wasn't long before the locals came knocking. I'm not sure why when women say students, men hear potential witches. Can girls not be scholars in peace? Anyway, the sanitarium guys started around 30 years ago. The neighbors leave us be. She punctuates her statement with a dramatic fake cough. But don't think, because you are just finding out about magic, it means no one else in the world knows. Oh, so who else knows? Max and Lena make nervous eye contact. Not appropriate breakfast conversation for young ladies, Maxine says. You can hardly blame me for having questions. Maxine glances around. A tendril of silver blonde hair falls from her bun and into her eyes. Fine. She springs up, smoothing her pinafore. Where are you going? I ask. Keep your voice down. Follow me. Lena and I follow her without another question. Despite Maxine's breakneck pace, I drink in as much of Hag's Haven as I can. It looks like a cathedral and a manor house and a hospital all at once. We crisscross Hag's Haven winding halls until we finally come to an ancient-looking stone door. It's carved with rune-like markings in a language I don't recognize. Maxine waves her hand and the door slides open with a low scraping sound. I hear Lena give a Small snot. You can manipulate objects too? She asks. I thought you were a finder. Finder? Maxine laughs. I've always wished there was a more elegant term for what we do. Surely finder isn't the best we can come up with. She shakes her head. But I digress. I can manipulate better than some, but not as well as others. My magic is one of connection. I can feel the connections between people and power most easily. But manipulating the way objects are connected to other objects isn't so difficult. Her answer begs more questions than it answers, but I swallow them down and follow her through the door. I'm almost giddy witnessing Maxine's use of magic as if it's an ordinary task. Each spark I see solidifies the new reality I inhabit. Confirms that all of this, that magic is real. The terror of everything that happened yesterday only slowly starts to subside as my curiosity begins to take over. Breath catches in my throat at the cavernous room filled with floor-to-ceiling bookshelves made of shard black wood. The soaring ceilings are buttressed with gothic arches and along the ground molding are life-size stone statues of stern-looking women. I can't tell if the strange buzzing in my ears is coming from inside my head or from the walls. 
Like ducklings, Lena and I skitter behind Maxine to a worn table near the side of the room. Candles drip white wax onto the surface, their yellow flames reflected in the single glass of water placed among them. Despite the monstrous room, a claustrophobic pressure mounts in my lungs. Why the quick exit? Lena asks. I don't get the impression she and Maxine are particularly close. She looks as lost as I am. Fewer eavesdroppers here, and there are a few very important things I need you to understand. One, at Hack 7, the walls have ears. There are no secrets here. Two, not everyone here is your friend. A muscle in her sharp jaw twitches. The library smells of parchment and kerosene. So, as you were saying, Lena prompts Maxine, the witches of Hack 7 are not the world's only possessors of magic? Oh, God, no. That would be rather narcissistic, would it not? So who else, I ask? Haxhaven is rather good at finding every magical girl in the area. Rich, poor, any race from any neighborhood. Girls whose parents thought they were boys upon birth. Girls who are un- only sometimes girls. Girls who are still deciding. People who are neither boys nor girls. We train them off. The men are left to their own devices. They do what men do. Destroy things, hold money, fight each other? Lena quips. Precisely. What do we do when we leave? I ask. We are allowed to leave, right? Maxine and Lena exchange a look that makes me nervous. But Maxine answers me after a tense moment. They do what most women do. Marry, have children, work. I've heard rumors of a few magical communities in the city. I believe there is at least one underground magic market. I once overheard Helen speak of a coven on Martha's vineyard, but she refused to tell me more. Maxine's brutal confidence flickers out for a second. I wish I knew more. That's all she's told you? I prompt. I only know that we are supposed to treat everyone we meet with extreme caution. If someone arrives at the gates, we do not let them in. So the wall around the school exists, as much to keep us in as it does to keep others out. That means whoever left the note on my bed last night has to have been someone in the school. I don't know how to ask Maxine and Lena. Who here knows about my dead brother and why did they leave a terrifying note on my bed? But Maxine is still looking at me expectantly. So I move on to my second most pressing question. How does a world with magic work? The way it always has. The magic isn't new. Your awareness of it is. Maxine says. So tell me more. Tell me the rules. Tell me how it works. If it's real, teach me to be so powerful. No one ever touches me without my permission again. My curiosity builds and builds. I can't stop it. I don't want to. If I know it, magic, how it works, being a witch, all of it, maybe I won't be so afraid anymore. She smiles at me, finally pleased with something I've said. You have to be present for the magic to work. It is exceedingly difficult to magic more than one object at a time. You'll learn spells in class and those will help you focus the energy. The first day or two after a magical awakening are strange. We aren't usually able to do spellless magic after this, except by accident. But Mrs. Wykotsky doesn't react well to magical accidents. She turns on her voice to mimic Mrs. Wykotsky's. The worst thing a girl can do is lose control of herself. Have you? I ask. Have I what? Maxine replies. Lost control? Mrs. Wykotsky only has two finders at Hack 7. She needs my skills to find new pupils more than I need her. But please do know, Mrs. Wykotsky does not make empty threats. She sighs and the corner of her mouth twitches up. I like you, just a little, and like for us to be friends. So please be careful, but don't be boring. Maxine's affection feels like a bit when the vicious mooser cat we had in the shop decided her favorite place to nap was under my desk. Something sweet and rare and a little dangerous. One wrong move and my ankles might be torn to shreds. I'm not naive enough to trust anyone here. 
but I desperately want to trust Maxine and Lina. If we are to be friends, there are a few questions I'd like answered. This is a school, correct? Who teaches the classes? How does any of this work? A combination of teamwork and magic. Max intros. I'm serious. So am I. She laughs. And despite my frustration, I find myself laughing too at the ridiculousness of it all. Magic is typically evoked by an event in someone's life. For most of us, that event occurs in adolescence. But we don't find some witches until adulthood. Other girls are just children. Everyone stays for different lengths of time depending on ability. That's why the sanitarium guys work so well. It takes different people different amounts of time to gain enough control to be ready to rent your society. Just like a real sanitarium. I echo in my conversation with Mrs. Wykotsky. Lena chews on her cheek then answers, Only if you think the magic is a disease. Is it? If you let it be. I don't know Lena well enough to know for certain. Her face is purposefully impassive. But if I had to guess, she seems sad. How long have you been here? It is perhaps the wrong question to ask, but I can't stop myself. Nearly two years, she says. Happy anniversary to me. Her words bite with sarcasm. I remember what the headmistress said yesterday about most girls staying for the school for years. My heart aches for Lena, who looks like she'd rather be anywhere but here. And you, Maxine? I ask. A table sits close enough to one of the long rectangular windows that I press my hands to the glass just to feel something cool and steady. Fat clouds float by in an autumn sky of brilliant blue. Six years? They found me when I was 13. I wonder what happened to wake their magic, but it feels impolite to ask. How did you find me? How did they find you? I ask. The memory of Maxine and Helen appearing in the shop to rescue me from the police, as if by magic playing in my head. Which is like Helen and me can sense disruptions in the energy source. Usually it means a flare-up of power for the first time. It comes to me like a vision. It's strange every time it happens. I don't often know their names. I only knew yours because... The officers were talking about you outside your shop. At her mention of police, Lena cast a sidelong glance at me. Do you bring all the people you feel to Hackshaven? I ask. Usually, she bites at her thumbnail. Not always? You have to ask Wykotsky, she asks an eyebrow, and I nearly laugh at the thought of ever returning to that office voluntarily. Under the table, I pick at a cuticle. What does this all mean for me, then? It means you're home. We are stuck with each other. From somewhere far off, a bell chimes. Max and Andina spring from their chairs. Time for your first class, little Francis, Max and declares. Then I will show you the way. I follow her and Lena out of the library and into the hall. With one kiss blown over her shoulder, Max and trots away. Girls rush off in all directions. Their heads down, mouth shut, capes flapping behind them. Through serpentine corridors, Lena and I weave between our classmates. The halls echo with the sounds of heels on flagstone floors and hushed conversation. After a long, awkward stretch of silence, I ask Lena, Where did you live before this? A place called the Thomas School. That sounds nice. It wasn't. Her answer is fast and certain. Oh. I'm sorry, why did you go then? It wasn't a choice. All of the children from my tribe were forced to go. The nuns came every fall to collect us. I'm sorry. Lena shrugs, but there is tension in the line of her shoulders. Soon we reach an open door and join the stream of girls pouring inside. We enter a room filled with rows of marble top benches, simple stools set behind them. Two skylights set high in the arched ceiling Illuminate the room with twin beams of morning light. Lena and I take seats behind one bench near the back. At the front of the room, standing in front of a well-worn slate, is an old woman with wire-rimmed glasses. A new pupil! She exclaims the moment I sit down. I pop back up from my stool and wave, which feels stupid. The chalk in the air makes my eyes sting. 
Your name, dear? She prompts. Frances Halloween. She clutches her heart with pride of a mother. Ah, my darling Frances, how delighted I am that you have joined us. This is Practical Applications and I am Mrs. Roberts. She turns her attention to the rest of the class. Girls, your books, if you please. It's strange to be back in a classroom. I never took much joy in school, was never hungry for it the way I am now. From the built-in shelves below the benches, the girls pull identical leather-bound copies of a book that looks similar to the hymnals at the church we used to go to when I was little. Then William stole enough Bibles that my mother was too embarrassed to go back. Ten-year-old William thought it was the height of comedy. Those Bibles lived under his bed until he died, though none of us ever read them. Turn to page 224, would you, darlings? While my classmates rifle through the onion skin pages of their books, Mrs. Roberts circulates through the room, distributing squares of scrap fabric, assorted buttons, needles, and thread. At the corner of the bench, Lena and I share, we receive two pieces of dark blue muslin and two delicate mother-of-pearl buttons. Mrs. Roberts returns to the front of the classroom, perches at a lectern, and flips open her own book. I glance down at my open book, and my vision goes a little fuzzy. I don't know what the text is, but it is not English. There are drawings of human hands surrounding by looping arrows as if they were instructions for a dance. Magic. I resist the smile that pulls up at the corner of my mouth. Ladies, we'll be continuing the swing lessons we began last week. Francis, dear, in my class, you'll learn to apply magic to your everyday life. As witches, it is our responsibility not to burden the world with our power, but it is in our best interest to burn off a little, day by day, in order to be our best selves. Miss Jamison, would you be so kind as to begin? With a nearly inaudible sigh, Lena reaches over and snatches a square of dark blue cotton, a needle, a length of thread and a button. She takes a breath and begins to read in a low, steady voice, Nal Sim Ga. Her hand loops in a figure eight. The needle, as if held by an invisible hand, levitates from the bench. With her other hand, Lena pinches the thread so about, an inch is sticking up from her thumb and pointing finger. The needle swoops down and threads itself before falling to the bench with a tiny cling. I've been told that magic exists. I've witnessed it already, but still seeing the needle levitate off the table and thread itself knocks the wind out of me. Very well done, Miss Jamison. Let's work on those pronunciations, though. Darling, there's still a bit of... Come see. Lena nods, then tilts her head back and massages the bridge of her nose. Are you all right? I whisper. How's magic? All this gives me a headache. I'll be fine. Mrs. Roberts, appearing at my shoulder, makes me jump. She moves with the silence of a cat stalking prey. Your turn, Miss Hallowell, she says. I suddenly feel much like I did when I was in fourth grade and had forgotten to do my report on President Franklin Pierce. How? Just take a breath and say the words on the page. She makes bending the laws of the universe sound so simple. I close my eyes like I saw Lena do. Then I loop my hand in the same figure eight in front of my chest and say, Nal Sen Ga. The words are awkward. My tongue doesn't know how to form the syllables. The sounds stick in my throat like peanut butter. This magic feels different than the sewing shears. It's more like learning to hold a pencil. A part of me that is both me and more than me stirs awake. And for the first time since my brother's death, I feel like a participant in my own life. I open one eye. The needle is levitating off the desk. A wave of excitement washes over me, and with my shriek of victory, the needle falls with a ting. Mrs. Roberts places a warm hand on my shoulder. Well then, Frances, we'll try again tomorrow. She floats onto the next pupil, and I thumb the mother of pearl button, marveling at the things I did not know I had inside me. The rest of the class passes quickly. I soak in all the magic I am able watching classmate after classmate levitate and thread the needle. Mrs. Roberts is kind, adjusting hand positions and pronunciations. It's tedious and nothing like the wild magic that made my swing shears fly across the room. But there is something comforting in the control 
it gives me over the pounding in my chest. A sharp bell dismisses us and Lena kindly offers to walk me to my next class. All the new arrivals go to Mrs. Lee's class. So you won't be there too? No, I take emotional control with Mrs. Porosgi and a group of girls who arrived around the same time I did. After that, I'll head to Claire Wancy. Claire Wancy? I open my mouth to ask her the hundreds of questions on the tip of my tongue. Don't ask me to tell your future, she quips. But if you don't ask me to tell your future, I'll show you where your next class is. I thought you were doing that already, I say with a laugh. I'm not above leaving you in the hallway. It would take you days to find your way out. I sigh. Deal. We trot through the halls of Hackshaven, and although most of my classmates cast their eyes downward, I can't help but gaze up at the swooping buttresses and sparkly chandeliers. It's almost enough to make me forget about the note, still tucked under my mattress. Lena leaves me at the door with a polite wave. Sitting at the front of the room is a woman in her early 60s, perhaps with snowy white hair and a serene smile on her face. I wonder if perfect posture comes naturally with being a bitch, or if it is something that is taught at Hackshaven. Ah, Frances, she waves me over. I am Mrs. Lee. It is my pleasure to welcome you to class. Thank you, ma'am. You have been placed with me and a small group of girls with similar powers who all arrived here recently, like yourself. I nod, and with another wave of her hand, she gestures for me to take a seat in the circle of chairs, where a few of my classmates have filled in. Welcome, friends, she greets us. We all take a seat, arranging our capes and black skirts around us. We have a new pupil with us here today. Would you please introduce yourself? Every girl in the room turns their gaze to me, and all the blood in my body rushes to my face. Frances Hallowell, I answer. And why are you here? Mrs. Lee prompts me. I'm afraid I don't understand the question. What happened to awaken your magic, dear? I briefly consider lying. There is nothing I'd like to avoid more than telling a room full of strangers the story of the worst moment of my life. I settle on half the truth. My boss attacked me. She nods, her lips pursed. Ah, I see. And how did that make you feel? Make me feel? Yes, Frances. How did your boss attacking you make you feel? I wish everyone would stop staring at me. Their unblinking gazes turned the bubble joy I felt moments ago flat and sour. She can't be serious. It made me feel bad, I finally answer. She turns just slightly to a mousy girl who sits to my right. I sigh in relief at the reprieve of her gaze. And what do we do when we feel bad, Sarah? We take deep breaths, Sarah says. We center ourselves. We remember we are in control of our bodies and ourselves. Yes, very good, Mrs. Lee replies. Magic is, above all, mastery over yourself. What follows is hours of girls spinning tales of their most horrible moments and describing the way their hearts raise, their anger, their sadness. Mrs. Lee sits with her perfect posture and tells my classmates that they must breathe deeply and picture their soul becoming small and retreating back into their chest. I'm sick with fascination or maybe I'm just comforted in knowing I'm not the only one who has experienced the horror that comes with feeling dangerous and out of control. Two hollow-eyed girls on the other end of the circle detail their experiences in the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory fire that ap appeared to have happened a few months ago in Midtown. It was all over the papers. 146 people died. Sarah and Cora should have been among them, but the horror of the accident evoked the magic in them, and they used their abilities to open a locket of sto stolen steel door and flee to safety. Sarah and Cora take turns telling parts of the story of that awful day. I get the impression they have told it many times in this room. They seem well practiced in noting the details. Cora describes the smell of burning flesh while Sarah explains the screams. Mrs. Lee tells them story must learn to control the power that resides within them. 
it strikes me as odd that no one in the room acknowledges that it was that bar that saved their lives. Mrs. Lee nods and looks appropriately sympathetic at all the right moments and tells us again and again that we are in control of ourselves. It's too much to stare at their vulnerable faces, so I memorize the features of this classroom, as strange and different as the last one. It reminds me of the basement of a church, windowless, with walls that look like they're covered in dripping wax. The candelabra overhead cast the paintings on the waxen walls in golden shadows. I watch them flicker and change until Mrs. Lee announces class is finished. Lena is waiting for me outside the door after we are dismissed. My steps fall into sync with hers, and soon we are in dining room. A lunch spread out before us. Lena sits down next to me and serves herself a bowl of soup. I follow suit, finally hungry. After a moment, I ask, What was all that? Mrs. Lee's class? She glances over at me. She believes in purging oneself of emotions. You're lucky that's all it was. I heard the woman who taught the class before Mrs. Lee was enthusiastic about practical demonstration. What do you mean? She spent the class period throwing books and screaming at the students when they had enough control over their powers to not react. She deemed them ready to start learning spells. That sounds preferable. Honestly, I laugh. Lena flashes a knowing smile. Well then, I'm afraid you will be disappointed by the academic offerings here. All of the classes are like that? More or less. Without proper control, the power can ruin your life. Her voice is monotone, as if she is repeating something she has been told but does not believe. After lunch, Lena takes me to a third classroom, paneled with rich mahogany. Again, she leaves me at the door. I sit down next to a tiny girl with dark brown skin and black curly hair tied into a bun at the base of her neck. Marble, she greets me, holding out a small hand. Francis. Her smile is sunshine itself, a relief after being in Mrs. Lee's cave of classroom for so long. The teacher for this class is a pale redhead I saw walking across the entryway when I arrived yesterday. She introduces herself, and I immediately forget her name. Her voice is sweet but dull. Lena told me this was a history class. I never cared much for history at school, but I am teetering on the edge of my chair with excitement for this lesson. If magic exists in the world, surely it has influenced every significant historical event. Were the magic revolutionary war heroes, a Helen of Troy capable of destroying ships with her very soul? My mind is racing with the possibilities, but my excitement turns to confusion and disappointment when the instructor begins her lecture on witch-owned apothecaries in the 17th century. Maybe I just entered on a dull day. That would be my luck. Some girls take dutiful notes, and the sound of fountain pens dipped in ink scratching across parchment fills the classroom like a chorus of insects. Others, like me, stare at the chalk-covered board, our eyes glazed over. I have been sitting for 45 minutes listening to the significance of witchcraft to women's economic development in pre-industrial America when I can't take it anymore. I shoot my hand up in the air. I never used to ask questions in school, but I have never had questions I cared this much about before. The other girls snap their heads toward me. The teacher raises her eyebrow. Yes? I ask the same question I asked Maxine. Who else has magic? It can't just be us. Magic is exceedingly rare, she says with the patience of a primary school teacher. But that doesn't mean... I apologize, Miss Hallowell. But this is our last lesson for the day. I encourage you to make use of the library. How lovely it is to have such an engaged pupil. The rest of my questions tie on my tongue. I'd forgotten how rotten it is to be made to feel stupid by a teacher. She's right. It was rude to interrupt the lesson. It's just I don't remember the last time I was this excited to learn. After class and the break, before dinner, I go to the library, anxious to see what else I can find about magic in the books that reside there. I was numbed inside before yesterday, but now a light of hope fills my chest and I can't contain it. I don't want to. It's nice feeling this way. Evening is falling fast and the whole place is lit with candelabras like a cathedral. I wander up and down the aisles, 
for what feels like forever but find only gothic novels and encyclopedias. There doesn't seem to be a mention of magic anywhere in this library but feel steeped in it. There are a few other girls in the library but none of them are reading. They are just sitting, legs propped up on the tables, chatting or playing cards. I follow them to dinner a while later, more confused than disappointed by my feelings. It will be fine. I'll be a better student. Today I have magic running through my veins, and that is enough. At dinner, Lena laughs a little at one of my jokes. Maxine shares a piece of cherry pie with me. I smile. And for the first time in four months, it doesn't feel like I'm pretending. To be continued. Thank you for listening to this part and I hope I see you in part three of the Witch Heaven. Have a nice day ahead.